Hello, Ben. He's a sex god, isn't he? I think he is. He brings out the gay man in me, the best side of it. So where's the chalkboard? We getting the blackboard here? Oh, there it is. I'm going very old school today precisely to throw down a point. Uh, I think you're all tired of PowerPoint presentations anyway by this time. So I talked to George Dyson before, and George said, Alexander, isn't the same thing with you? You either end up opening a conference or closing it. And I said, yeah, that's always what happens to me. And the same thing always happens to George, and we have no idea why. They always put it at the beginning or the end. Today, George started the day, and I'm going to finish it. So um, probably because we're the only two speakers here today who are either not startups or venture capitalists. We're doing something completely different and totally useless that none of you can make a business out of. And that's exactly why we're here, to remind you of the world outside of startups. So um, let's see. Chalk and a sweeper. This is what your grandfathers and grandmothers used to get, used to, get to know. Uh, I have two jobs to begin with. My name is Alexander Bard. I'm 51 years old. I currently live in Stockholm in Sweden, which is exactly like Berlin, only more expensive. Um, I used to live here too, 10 years ago, because I'm always ahead of things before the Swedish invasion took place in the city. And the South Cloud and Red Mill and all the other Swedish boys came here. But I'm perfectly happy to live in Stockholm too and then go back and forth. So I do two things. I have two jobs. Uh, right now, I'm working with a project called Gravitonas. And I'm not going to present it on slides because I don't want to be a salesperson. This is only to tell you what I do. Gravitonas is considered probably the first Spotify-only music project ever developed. And I'm doing this together, ironically, with the world's biggest record company called Universal Music. We're working in 40 different countries. And the whole idea is to provocatively create music that can only be available through streaming. I want to kill the CD. I want to kill iTunes. I know this hurts in the ears of Germans, the most technologically conservative people on the planet, and the last country in the world that still sells CDs in shops. Please move into 2012 by now and do like Korea and Sweden. Get rid of the CD once and for all. Get rid of iTunes while you're at it. There's absolutely no point at all in having a hard drive with any kind of information on it anymore in 2012, when everything can be streamed into your pocket wherever you are on the planet. So I'm really thrilled about that. You can Google Gravitonas if you're interested. I'm actually going to see Universal Music Deutschland tomorrow. They're the last universal company in Europe I talked to about the project. But then I didn't expect Germans to jump on it first. I expected the Russians to be first on it, and that's exactly what happens. Because Russia is now much more technology friendly than Germany is, for a good reason. I don't consider Berlin to be Germany, by the way. You're far ahead of the rest of Germany. It's like New York and America. Come on. So that's, that's one job, but that's why I'm here today. I'm here today because in 1995, I was hired by the Stockholm School of Economics. I was headhunted to become the world's first internet sociologist. So what I do is that I've been connected to the net for 25 years, and that's exactly why they hired me. But I was hired not because I'm a technology expert or because I'm great at doing business, although I turn out to be pretty good at that too. I was hired because I'm a sociologist, and not only a sociologist, I'm actually a philosopher as well today. And I'm here today because a couple of weeks ago, we published all my three books in America, in English, uh, called the Futurica Trilogy. I've written three books together with media theorist John Sedekvist. The first book came out 12 years ago and was called The Netocrats. And if you want to find the common roots both for the pirate movement, for Pirate Bay, and for Spotify in one and the same place, that's the book to find. It was a prophetic book at the time. It predicted both Facebook, Google, and Al-Qaeda, all three internet phenomena. The internet is, by the way, not a good thing. It's just as bad as it's good. It's just revolutionary. And uh, then I wrote two more books, a really heavy one called The Global Empire, which is like technical philosophy. It's so damn hard to understand that most of you guys will read two pages and then give up. So unless you're narcissistic, you're not going to read it. And then the third book is called The Body Machines, which thankfully it's a lot easier to read. The reason why we wrote three books and then finally published them this year 
as the Futurica trilogy in America and shipped 32,000 books the first week, e-books only, of course, in America, is because these books tackle the profound revolution that is the internet. Everywhere I go today, people talk about different phenomena that relate to the internet. And Next12 is a perfect example of that. You get tiny little glimpses from everybody of what they're working on, trying to develop um, a video messaging service or something like that. But it's all tiny little things and tiny little aspects of what the internet truly is. But like George Dyson said, the internet in itself is one being, one sentient being. And we have to understand the phenomenon exactly in that context. And that has been my prophecy all along, and that is my message. We have to understand that this is one of the four biggest revolutions that happened to mankind, possibly the biggest one of them all. That's exactly why we live in very revolutionary, dramatic times. And that's exactly why all the traditional rules of, for example, how you run a business are wiped out and replaced. Even rules like, what is it like to be a human being have changed. What is it like to live in a society has changed. All these things change right now. And therefore, we have to go back and study history. We have to learn from history to understand what's going on in our age. We even have to rewrite history to understand ourselves better. Because the only tool we have to understand ourselves and the society we live in is history. I'll give you a perfect example of that. Um, stone, bronze, and iron. What do you think of when you hear those three terms? You think of the Stone Age, you think of the Bronze Age, and you think of the Iron Age, right? Do you seriously believe that Stone Age people were aware of the fact that they lived during the Stone Age? Except for a family Flintstone or something like that? No? No, you wouldn't think that. You're smiling, right? You know what the tragedy is? The tragedy is that schools in Germany and Sweden are still teaching kids that there was a Stone Age, which is just like a total lie. There was never any Stone Age. That was made up much later. The interesting thing here is to understand when was the Stone Age, the Bronze Age, and the Iron Age invented, and for what reason? And it turns out all these three terms, if we Google history, we find that originally they started, they started use in, in the 1850s. So these three concepts were invented in the 1850s for a very specific purpose. They were invented because historians are really cheap guys with bad salaries. So they have to get paid by somebody. And that's to our advantage. If you were a historian in the 13th century, you would write history and said, originally there was Adam and Eve and a rib and a snake and a Garden of Eden, blah, 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 blah. And that's where history started. That was the only history available, so it was the only history you could believe in. That's because historians were obviously paid by the Pope. You know, the German guy sitting in Rome. Yeah, who some people still believe in, especially the pedophiles. Yeah. Not I. There you go. So. What about these three, then? Well, if they were invented in the 1850s, I would propose that the Stone Age, as an idea, probably says a lot more about countries like Germany and Sweden in the 1850s than it says about the Stone Age. It was invented because they're physical, physical materials. And they're physical materials that are said to be domesticated and tamed. Because taming and domesticated physical materials, it was being a human being is all about to a person from the 1850s. Because in the 1850s, historians were paid by the factory owners, by the industrialists. This was the age of industrialization. And industrialization had a magic to it. The way people perceived industrialization in the 1850s in Europe and America was that this was going to save us. This was the future. This is what everything was all about. Everything in history was leading up to this. So you had to have a history that said, first we tamed the stone, then we tamed bronze, then we tamed iron, and one day we built in factory in Brandenburg. And that was the peak of history. That was the whole purpose of being a human. May I propose one thing to the education ministers of Germany and Sweden, for example? May I propose to them that we're not living in the 1850s anymore, we're living in 2012? Maybe we should have a history that's slightly more relevant to us? Do you think that's a provocative statement for me? 
ironically, nothing is happening. But I'll tell you one thing. They don't teach the Stone Age anymore in school class in Korea. They stopped doing that 30 years ago, realizing it was irrelevant. What we need today is to understand what's going on. And the internet has been described in many different ways. The three most common metaphors are the information society, the communication society, and the network society. And as a philosopher, I have to admit, I love cliches. Because cliches that are in wide use often reveal the inner truth of what's going on. I'd say we, this is both an information, a communication, and a network society. That's what the internet society is. But even more than that, just like innovative historians in the 1850s threw out Adam and Eve and invented the Stone Age, it was a much better, more relevant history to them, we can innovate and create a new history to understand ourselves, the time we live in, and to understand and predict the future much better by rewriting history today. That's exactly why my speech today is called The Internet History as a History of Information Technologies. So the radical proposal I have today is that the information society did not start in California in the 1970s. All societies that ever existed were information societies. That's the only way to look at history with relevance to us today. And it turns out, if you look at history that way, we discover that we have four dramatic revolutions in terms of information technologies that we as human beings have gone through. And those are the four different ways we communicate with each other. The first one, of course, is the difference between a human being and an ape. I know if you stand in a bar on a Wednesday night in Berlin and you're really drunk, you know, and you're flirting with somebody, usually you just go, oh, 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 and it's really hard to tell the difference between you and an ape. But okay, but the rest of the week, the other six days a week, you probably, you're probably able to talk. And if you can talk, you can hopefully think, which is talking to yourself. This phenomenon is called speech, and it makes us distinctly different from monkeys and apes. And it makes us human beings. And it's the original information revolution that started about 200,000 years ago, when we started to use abstract symbols to communicate with each other. And suddenly, we were far more powerful than the lions and the hyenas on the prairie, because we could do something they could not. We could talk to each other, shout to each other with abstract symbols. That's very, very useful. That's the first revolution. The second revolution, oh, shock, written language. Mesopotamia, modern Iraq, 5,000 years ago. We start to write down abstract symbols. We find a new way of communicating with each other. And you know what we can do with that? We can store information for the first time outside of our own brains. If an old woman dies, it's no longer a disaster to the tribe. That means we can create permanent settlements. We can start agriculture. We can start domestication of animals and plants. We can store information and become wiser. And when we die, people can build on our experience. We can start something called civilization. There is no civilization anywhere without written language. But with written language, the total amount of information available to us as human beings explodes over one million times over. That's definitely a new paradigm. That's definitely a new type of information society. The third big revolution happened only 600 years ago, and it was here in Germany we started. And that's printed language. Now it gets interesting. Now you have to start think. Why is printed language a third revolution? It is a revolution because all we really focus on here is the amount of information available to us. The amount of information we can do something with. Because that is what was empower us as human beings. Power is always the power of information. Is always knowing things that other guys don't know. If you run a startup, the only way to beat the other guys is by knowing things they don't know. So that's where power is always residing. And that's exactly what printed language does. In the 1450s, in the 1450s in Germany, it cost on average 150,000 euros to produce one single fucking book. 150,000 euros per book because every book that was published had to be handwritten. And we had an army of hundreds of thousands of monks and nuns all over this continent who were all handwriting books. In the 1550s, once the printing press had taken hold, it cost on average 30 cents 
to print and publish a book. Now, if you've got a lot of books all around, around you all of a sudden that are really, really cheap, that means there's going to be far more books, there are going to be more book titles published. It's going to mean it's going to be a lot more costly for people, less costly for people, to invest in an education where they can learn how to read and write. And when we finally reach the 1850s, we have 100% people in countries like Germany and Sweden who can read and write. Of course, they have then far more information accessible to them than they did in the 1450s. But please note here that when the printing press exploded, we also had 350,000 people around Europe who were demonstrating hating the new technology, resisting it for all they could, saying it was evil, saying it was going to destroy the world for them. That's exactly what people do today when they're fat and lazy and live in old industrial countries like Germany and Sweden, when Brazil, India, South Africa, and all the other guys are coming on board, jumping into the new revolution. Remember that. If you were the winner in the last paradigm, you're far less likely to jump to all the new solutions. So learn from history and be very humble here. That's the printed revolution. That was the last revolution. So what's so special about the internet? Didn't we get radio? Didn't we get television? Didn't we get all these other media? Again, you're looking at it from a technological perspective. I don't fucking care if something is electronic or printed or whatever. I care of how it's being used. What happens to it when it's in the hands of human beings? Does it provide information to people? That's what I'm interested in. And printed media did that compared to written media. But the interesting thing is that in the 1970s in California, when university and Navy and, and Army computers were connected with each other, we started to create something brand new called the Internet. This is the fourth revolution. Does it qualify in terms of information available? Well, it does. From the 1st of January 2008 to the last of December 2008, human society produced more information than they produced throughout the entire history up until the last December 2007. Even if most of the stuff on the internet is junk, most information was always junk anyway, it's still a true information explosion. Let me show you how this works. Mass media. Mass media is newspapers, books, paper money is mass media. Radio and television, they all work this way. Usually there's only one source of power. To run a TV station, radio station, a newspaper, or to be able to print money, you have to be somebody very, very special. Usually you have a monopoly. So mass media is produced from a center that gives dictates, orders to the people who are down here. That's how it works. It's information is flowing almost always in one direction only. That's what mass media looks like. That's how it's structured. Mass media looked like this from the 1450s onwards. What happened with radio and television when mass media became electronic is that it became only more efficient. To be honest with you, television slightly sort of sobered us up, because the radio society was the worst society we ever invented, and the most dangerous one. That was Adolf Hitler in Germany in the 1930s, and that was Rwanda in the early 1990s, and that was Yugoslavia in the 1980s. Typical examples of radio societies, where a dictator speaking on the radio, we can't even see how evil he is, can really make you go out and kill your neighbor. Thank God for television. It less sober, sobered us up a little. Radio was a really dangerous thing. What happened? was that we all of a sudden had computers in our hands. And the computers were also communicating directly to us from the very beginning. We all got access. We all had TV and newspapers and all those things on our, on, on our computers, too. But the computers also enabled us when they were interconnected with each other, which is what the internet is. We could communicate directly with each other. So what happened was that slowly but steadily, from the 1980s onwards, people started to communicate directly with each other, commenting on what mass media did to them. And this commentating grew and grew and grew. And it became Wikipedia, and it became Google, and it became Facebook. It became all kinds of phenomena that no longer needed this. And finally, this relationship was cut off. This is the world today. And this is the world that's dead. Don't tell Angela Merkel, she hasn't found out yet. This is where we live now. We have moved, all of us have moved to an entirely different world compared to where we used to live before. By the way, how much time do I have left? 10 minutes. Okay, great.
So we have a brand new world that we live in. And we have to look at it that way. And it's only when we do this radical change, when we move from one world to the next and live it fully, that we completely understand it and we start to make the right decisions. I became known in the late 90s as a really foul guy who predicted the dot-com crash. That wasn't a very popular idea, but it was actually very easy to see for the simple reason that the dot-com phenomenon was built on the idea that you could take the new technology and tame it like, it, like you would tame iron, bronze, or stone, and then turn it into money. Well, when I studied the internet, I only saw shortcuts. To me, the internet was all about shortcuts, getting rid of the old companies and making shortcuts between producers and customers everywhere. And that's exactly what the internet does. Not a single person in here has gone to travel agency to get your flight ticket to Berlin. Not a single one. Do you even have cards any longer? Who has cards in here? You're either German or you're over 40 years old if you still have a card. The rest of the world doesn't have cards anymore because you don't live in physical space any longer. So let's look quickly at these two paradigms. Oh, this should really take three hours. I've got five minutes. We have the mass media society here, and we have the internet society here. How are they radically different? They're radically different in every aspect. We used to produce money from industry. Factories today are located in Bangladesh and southern China and hardly anywhere else. That means they're probably not very important anymore for the economy. The economy has moved on to media. Everything is media today, and most of the value in anything you buy today is in media. If you, if you pay two, two euros for a bottle of mineral water, the water is probably going to be worth three cents at the most. The rest is just going to be media value. So the economy has moved on to media by now. Let's see. Short one. We used to live in cities. We used to have cards with postal addresses on them. These days, we don't need cards. We just need to pick up our names, and then we can find each other on Facebook or Twitter, and we're, in connect we're connected. Because we live online today. Five years ago, you would still pick up your cell phone and you would go, you know what, this is really funny, but I'm actually on vacation in Bali, in Indonesia. Isn't it ironic we can talk to each other in real time? And these days, if you tell that somebody, they just go, I don't care where the fuck you are. I'm just care if you're close to your cell phone or not. Because geography is now reduced to the human body and the cell phone and how far they are from each other. That's what geography is. We moved on to cyberspace. We live there. We move there. We build our identities there. If you're going to try to get a job or get an investor to your startup, the first thing to do is to go to your Facebook page. And if it looks the slightest bit sloppy, they cut you off. Because that is your presentation to every other human being on the planet. That's where they go to find out who you are. In my case, the Wikipedia entry, probably. So this world used to run on money. It was all about capital. It was all about whoever owns the most money when he dies is the winner. That has now become irrelevant. Because the new world is operating according to the principle of attention. Attention is awareness times credibility, reputation. That's a multiplying relationship. You can read more about it in the Futuric Astrology if you like. Principally speaking, it's this. Awareness is do people know that you exist? If they don't know that you exist, they're never going to find you anyway. You're just going to be somewhere in the haystack, and they're never going to find you as their needle. People have to know that you exist. So creating an awareness, making people aware that you exist, is one part of attention. The other part of attention is that when they find out that you exist, they have to be attracted to you. They have to find you credible. They have to think of you as a serious person or a serious company that can deliver something they really, really need and really want. That's credibility. If you don't have one of the two, you're out. The internet is all about the combination of awareness and credibility. And please note, there's not a single dollar sign in here because we're now moving towards society with zero cost. Everything now is about your ideas. It doesn't cost you a penny to open a Facebook page. It doesn't cost you a penny to develop an idea. Other people might throw money after you thinking they can make money out of your idea, but it's no longer of interest here. It's not the primary interest anymore. We moved from the countryside to the city, now we move from the city to cyberspace, and with that we move from capital as the driving force to attention as the driving force. And everything now is about people having attention connecting with other people who have attention. Networks that have attention connecting with other networks that have attention. When Facebook and Spotify decided to do their thing together in America, I knew Sp Spotify would gonna beat iTunes in no time at all. And that's exactly what happened. A week later, four million Americans are paying for the Spotify subscriptions. 
because Spotify and Facebook, two really strong attentional brands, connect with each other. It didn't cost them one penny to do it. They just realized that if they connected with each other and connected the two brands to each other, that both had attention, they would both be winners, and they would gain even more. That is an attentional economy. It's not a money economy at all. Venture capitalists are at the back row of this economy. They're what you need the least. This creates a new power structure. We'll have a bourgeoisie, and we had workers before, you know, like Marx said in the 1800s. Today we have netocrats, and we have consumptarians. There's no digital divide. The divide is in the digital world. We're all online. Everybody's online in the world. People in India and Kenya and Brazil, everybody's online. It's online that division exists. And it's the division between netocrats and consumptarians. And consumptarians are basically 35-year-old men in Germany who live in the German countryside still with their mother. They're overweight. They don't have a proper education. They can't get a job. They vote for some far-right party. And they only watch porn when they go online because they don't need friends on Facebook because nobody wants to be friends with them. That's the new underclass. Not the immigrants who live in the suburbs of Berlin, because they all work in startups. They're winners. They're winners. If you live in Berlin, you're a winner. But my God, if you're stuck in Thüringen, you might be in for some trouble. That's the consumptarians. They're online, but all they do in porn stuff and play some stupid games sometimes. They're not connecting. They're not being socially intelligent. They're not interactive. They're not producing what they're involved with, which is what interactive people do. So, what we're looking at now is a whole new basis for identity. It used to be the nation state. How many people in this room are willing to live and die for Germany? Germany? For Germany, yeah. Not a single one. In 1915, you would have thrown up your arms, you walked straight onto the battlefield, and you all died happily. Because that, that's where identity comes from. Identity is a very, very, very strong thing. Today, the nation is dead. It's over and done with. It doesn't generate any interest. There are no websites for Germany.com. People couldn't care less. They might care about Berlin because they love Bergheim, but they don't care about Germany anymore. What they do care about now is subcultures. Subcultures is the sociological term. We can call it communities. We could call it networks. I call it tribes. The internet is best described, the internet society is best described as the golden age of sects and cults in a globalized empire. We should look to the Roman Empire for inspiration of what kind of world we're living in today. Because we're living in a globalized economy, and with America and China being closely interdependent of each other today, that means it's a global empire where nobody can go outside of the empire, not even Greece. They'll be reminded very soon they can't leave this empire. We're all inside this empire, but in this empire, in the virtual world, we are creating cults and sects. Some of them are nice and fun ones, and some of them are really evil ones, like Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda is as much an internet phenomenon as Facebook or Google. We have to realize that. We have let a hydra out of the bottle, and now we have to deal with this hydra, and we have no idea what it's doing to us. It is fucking us up. The internet is a monster, and it's eating us alive, and it doesn't care what we think, and we can't stop it. Because if you put an interactive mobile phone into the hands of a Korean schoolgirl, she will never go back to her old Nokia again, ever. That's how addicted we are now. We can't leave the fucking net. It's grabbed us inside our heads. It's a damn drug, and we're on it, everyone. So it's taken over us for good and bad. That's where we're at. That's where we have to start. So when you're thinking of your little startup and you're going to find your venture capital money, it's inside this system you have to be. Otherwise, you're out of it. Okay? Am I out of time now? I do have more time. I can't believe that. I can't believe that. Okay, okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Germans are so generous. That's why I love Berlin. Yeah, thank you. We have, I think, I think what I haven't written in these three books is the metaphysics of the Internet age. And I discussed it with Dyson this morning and said, yeah, that's the next big project we theorists have to do over the next 10 years. I think we need a metaphysics for the Internet. The way religion was a metaphysics for, for the uh, agricultural age, for the feudal society. 
It, it explained to people. It wasn't necessarily true all the time. Adam and Eve probably never existed, but who cares? It gave people an explanation, a fantasy world within which they could credibly live and they could put themselves. And that's exactly the great thing with monotheism as an explanatory framework for a society. Then we had humanism. French Enlightenment from the 17th century onwards was the ideology of the Industrial Age. Humanism believed in the strong individual. It believed in the ego. It believed there actually was a little old man sitting inside our head looking at the world like a cinema screen. Rene Descartes, I think, therefore I am. That's the birth of humanism. God was removed from the equation. Later he was killed by Nietzsche, my favorite German of all time. But the important thing here is that we had a metaphysics for the industrial age, for the mass media age, and that metaphysics was humanism. Now we have to understand that humanism is dead. The idea of the individual doesn't work with today's 17-year-olds. If you talk about individualism to today's 17-year-olds, they just shake their heads and they don't understand what you're talking about. That's like the strangest, weirdest thing ever. That's like Adam and Eve was to us. What do you mean, an old man sitting inside my head looking at the world from a cinema screen? You mean that there would be an individual in me, an ego that doesn't change? What a strange idea. Why? Because the kids today are individuals. They're divided human beings. They see themselves as bricks within systems. Oh, I'm this person in the morning, I'm this person in the afternoon, I'm this person at school, I'm this person on Facebook, I'm this person on Twitter, I'm another person in this community here. They experiment and they develop lots of different personalities. Congratulations to everybody with the schizophrenia diagnosis, you're winners. Because this is the golden age of schizophrenia. The more personalities you can handle within your one body, the more of a winner you will be. Because the more fascinating you will be as a person. Person is mask in Greek, very good word to use here. We have to speak of individuals rather than individuals to understand the kids today. They see themselves this way. They see themselves as playing around with their identity at all times, willing to change it rapidly if they gain any favors from changing their attitude. And by the way, because they're constantly affected by other people in the networks they move into, then they have no problem at all changing their personalities. That's exactly why kids love to take drugs, even legal ones. They don't mind changing personality. They don't believe in a sober ego that's always there on a Monday morning, reminding you of who you really are. There is no who you really are anymore. There are a lot of different who I can be. And you want more who I can be to choose from rather than less. So, while this society, our parents' society, was a society that believed in eternal progress, your parents worked hard so that you could be better off tomorrow. That was the idea of progress. It replaced the original idea of eternity. Oh, you work hard, and then you die, and then you go to heaven, and then you play harpsichord forever. That was the original metaphysics, eternity. Adam and Eve were supposed to go there. We were supposed to go here with our parents to progress, to building a better tomorrow. I don't think any kids today think they're going to be better off than the parents were. All they're going to say is that I'm going to live very differently from my parents because there's a lot of technology around that they never used. Their parents still have CDs. They only have Spotify just to begin with. So I think we're moving into an age where metaphysics will all be about the event in a deep sense, in Jacques Derrida's sense, the original innovation, the original philosophical concept from the 1960s of la vente in French. Avant. Event. We're looking for a trip. We're looking for a place to be where we feel that we grow as human beings, where we feel expanded, where we feel, oh, I feel much more of myself than I did yesterday. I feel I can harbor more personalities than I thought I could. That's exactly why we won't work in the same place or live in the same place for the most three years anymore, because then we have to move on. We only have one life to live. Hey, there's no eternity left. So let's make the most out of these lives we have. And what we do is we look for the event all the time. And to understand today's 20-year-olds, if you're going to hire them to your startup, you have to understand that your startup has to be the coolest event of all in Berlin. Otherwise, you're not going to get the best staff. Otherwise, they're going to go somewhere else. So I think this, the event, connected to the idea of subcultures from Japanese subway suicide sects to wonderful little Facebook communities for old ladies who love flowers from Latvia. Whatever there is, I don't care. 
But if you find your friends online and you communicate with them and you finally end up living with them and having sex with them, I can only congratulate you because you're onto a winning formula. And if you can then connect your startup to one of those communities, you're a real winner. Because whoever has access to and is a spokesman for a subculture is a netocrat, is a winner in a network society. There you go. Thank you.